Hello, my name is Morris Flynn and I'm here to talk to you today about how today's AI allows us to prepare and better and understand our data better. So I'm going to talk about this from three sort of points of view. First of all, just going to start with a general introduction to today's AI, what that means and how we can use that. I'm then going to move on to the specifics about how we can use certain techniques to really utilize our data, both the data we own within the business and data outside the business that increasingly we can get access to. And then I'm going to finish off with some case study examples and leave some time for Q&A. Just a bit about myself, I've been working in uh, related fields for three decades now across many different industries, companies large and small, and I've been really focused on the technologies and techniques of data science, in particular what we call today artificial intelligence, over the last six or seven years. And I've come at it from both a technical background, but also trying to make it much easier for everyone to use, especially the non-experts, the non-technical experts, because I do believe unless we can give easy access to the power of AI to uh, the full population, we're not going to see the real benefits. We're not going to gain all the uh, significant benefits that are possible. Okay, I'm just going to share my screen now. So just give me a moment. And I'll get that uh, working. Here we go. So that's uh, that's on the screen now, and uh, I'm just going to dive into a quick introduction to today's AI, what it means essentially, just to make sure we're all on the same um, page with that. Okay, so what is today's AI? So in general, artificial intelligence means when software and machines are able to demonstrate equal or better than human effectiveness and learning in complex challenges. There's a few definitions out there, a lot of confusion, a lot of misuse of the term artificial intelligence, but looking at what the real experts say, that seems to be uh, a definition that makes the most sense. Now, there are actually two types of AI that get discussed a lot today. The first we call narrow AI, and narrow AI is what we're really all experiencing all the time but we're often not aware, it's often invisible. This is where this technique, this technology is solving single focused issues, whether it's keeping spam from your email inbox or making sure that the recommendations from your favorite retailer are tailored to your preferences. We call this narrow AI. General AI is what the newspapers and the science fiction writers get excited about this is the idea of machines and computers becoming as intelligent or more intelligent than humans, and who knows what could happen after that. But the expert consensus is that we're very a long way away from that. There's narrow AI that we all want to be focusing on in our work today. So why is AI creating all the excitement at the moment? Well, around 2012, an approach that is a type of AI called deep learning was shown to enable rapid improvement in certain areas such as computer vision, so computers understanding images, and thereafter also around things like text understanding for translation tools. And since then, this same technique, used in a different way, we'll talk about it, has even been used to start creating content. You may have seen the news articles about fake videos and fake news articles and fake images created by this technique. This has caused a lot of excitement because the potential, the, the possibilities seem endless, but also fear because obviously there's danger of misuse. Now, this deep learning technique, which is causing all the excitement at the moment, is highly effective, but in fact, we don't know and the experts don't know exactly why it's so effective. They still haven't worked all that out. And as a result, it does need a bit of manual reorganizing and expertise to get it working. And that's why a second approach, which you may have heard about called machine learning, which is 
much better understood, much more uh, familiar for, for people in this space, has been much more widely adopted. And when you hear of companies talk about artificial intelligence, normally they're talking about what we uh, call machine learning, and we'll talk more about this. We're going to try and keep the technical side of things to a minimum and just use language as far as possible that we can all understand without needing to be experts. So, okay, so how does this AI work? Well, today's AI is basically a combination of quite old mathematics with new and ever cheaper computing power that we can now buy from the likes of Google, Amazon, etc. And it works using many different types of computer languages. The way it works essentially is that it finds patterns in historical data, so we can feed it a load of data from the past. It will find patterns, hopefully patterns that we may not have spotted ourselves. And then these patterns can be then used to either predict or forecast into the future or to understand images by predicting which ones look like each other. As I say, now even to create content such as images, audio, and videos. Just to mention in passing, ethical AI, a lot of people, myself definitely included, feel it's really important that we get off to the right start in terms of mass use of AI and keep the ethics of our AI carefully in mind. So what this means essentially at the moment is that we don't want to bake bias into these new systems by using dodgy data essentially. Now, let's bear in mind that the systems we're trying to improve are currently far from biased because they're human, and humans, we're not, unbi we're not unbiased. We can't help ourselves sometimes. So ethical AI, there's a lot of debate around this at the moment, but essentially it means ensuring the data that is used in these models is representative of what we're trying to analyze and use fairly in line with the risks involved and with a people-first mindset. So let's similar to a doctor, let's try and do good first and foremost. So the sort of questions we need to ask ourselves as we look at the data we've got for one of these projects is, you know, is this a high-risk area where extra care is, is definitely required, such as anything to do with anyone's health and health care, or is it a low-risk area like recommending one's favorite color of uh, trousers, for example? We also should ask things like, are we improving a bias system, in which case, hopefully that's a good thing, or are we in danger of introducing bias, and that's obviously a bad thing. Thirdly, are we using data that's fair and representative? A lot of debate around this at the moment. If the images that we are using in our analysis all represent a certain demographic, then the results will be biased as, as a result, uh, and therefore cannot be valid for certain types of predictions. And are we aiming for some kind of public good or solely private gain? And these, these uh, questions and the answers to those questions um, should give us guidance as to um, the speed that we should be going at and some of the caution we should uh, adopt along the way. Okay, you could spend a whole session talking about that alone, but we will crack on. Um, most important question for most of us, do I need AI? Why do I need AI? How is it helping my business intelligent processes? Well, looking to the near future, most experts agree that AI is going to reach everywhere where there is software over the next decade. And as a result, we're all going to need retraining to get used to this, and we're all going to need to be ready to battle against misuse of this powerful technology. But the potential benefits are huge. Um, some of the questions that help us understand if today's AI is relevant to our current business intelligence processes is do we or do our colleagues have to make decisions based on gut feel, talk to the board of most companies, and if they're honest, they'll admit they do. Secondly, do we, do our companies, do our clients sometimes fail to use customer data to continually improve. Yes, of course we do. Uh, we often work with tiny segments of our total available data set for all sorts of legacy issues. And 
thirdly, do we have competition that is more savvy with data and risks coming in and eating our lunch? Again, if we do, then they're going to be using these techniques, so we need to be aware of them. So most companies definitely want to be aware of this, and some industries are, are moving significantly faster, in which case the competitive pressure forces us to, to, to take action. What are the challenges with AI today, uh, even for data experts? Well, a big challenge is confusion around the expertise required for these projects. Too many experts I find in this space seem to love the jargon that makes this topic much harder to understand. Uh, and it's already complicated enough. Um, as a result, we come to the firm conclusion that you know, looking at the success case studies in this area, talking to companies that want to use it in their business intelligence processes, looking at the available tools out there, that the vast majority of the population who have limited technical skills or, or interest and limited so-called data science skills, which I calculate to be up to 99% of the population by a rough estimate, they need a simple approach in order to make this, uh, this technique more accessible for, for all. And we'll talk about how we do that. So in conclusion of that very brief overview, just to kind of get us all on the same page, the experts are telling us that AI can definitely be a force for good, mainly by putting expert capabilities in the hands of many more millions of people, hopefully even billions of people, than was ever possible before. Okay, so I'm going to skip now, just bear with me, to um, the final section. Hold on one second. Oh, just the last point here. What What is AI principally being used for currently? What is this technology being used for? So looking at hundreds of case studies, and we'll talk about some of these in the final section, um, the areas where AI is showing some real strong potential and delivery is around enhancing our limited human expert resources, whether it's across business experts, medical experts, um, creative experts, and that's been done by Big data analysis, so being able to analyze massive data sets that we couldn't possibly understand uh, with our human brains alone, uh, and making predictions of that, as well as analyzing content, understanding content such as images, text, videos now, and audio, and even creating some of that uh, content. So some of the specific areas that many of us are getting involved with or hearing excitement internally about, would be automation, and so hopefully helping our staff rather than replacing them in order to automate the low-value activities that tend to be boring and therefore can often lead to mistakes, giving them more time to focus on added value activities around making sure our customers are happy and being creative in our roles and finding new solutions. Secondly, prediction, whether it's financial, market or performance prediction, uh, HR analysis, trying to understand what type of people do well in a company, medical prediction, such as understanding x-rays and other types of medical images, uh, security, trying to protect us from the avalanche of constant uh, security attacks that we are exposed to online every, every day, and of course, good old-fashioned marketing and sales prediction, trying to sell our next widget. And then the last area is, as I say, around content creation, which is developed much more recently than the other areas. And But now, having moved on very quickly, we're starting to see images being created, uh, audios being created, videos being created. And although some of it is still a little bit rough, uh, it's certainly creating a lot of excitement. Okay, so let's skip on to the second section and really the crux of today's presentation in terms of how we specifically can integrate this AI and these AI processes into our business, business intelligence analysis so that uh, we can make things a lot easier and more successful for the business overall. So I've called this today's AI success factors, 
just going to have a quick check, see if any questions or any other issues have come up on the screen so far. Nothing so far, so at least from a technical standpoint, um, we can understand that things are going fine. Okay, today's AI success factors. So how are we going to use AI to help with our business intelligence processes? So uh, here we've got, based on the work we've done, based on the work of many experts around the world, based on the case studies we've got access to, the success elements that help ensure that bringing AI to the business intelligence party results in more success than failure. And let's be honest, this area is still very new for most companies. There will be some failures along the way. So start with something that may be pretty obvious, but I found time and time again, it can create a massive hurdle for these projects at the very first stage. Success factor one is having simple aims going into these projects. So um, what, what do we mean by that? What we mean is that um, too many companies I've worked with over the past seven or eight years, when they, even when they do have access to good data to use for these types of projects, they then spend too much time arguing about the aims and complicating the aims. Should we tackle this A or B or C or D? And then after a long extension, last much longer than was scheduled, uh, the data experts might disappear for a week or sometimes more, and then all too often come back saying the analysis can't actually be completed for a whole variety of reasons, lack of data, lack of tools, lack of access, lack of uh, understanding, and obviously this is a very inefficient process. So our recommendation based on lots of personal experience and also talking to other experts in this space is that currently, you know, unless you're a Google or a Facebook and have those types of resources, assuming you're not and you're a typical company, whether large and small, where there's always too much to do, everyone's always totally overstretched and any new initiative has to prove its worth very quickly or it gets forgotten or, uh, you know, put down to the bottom of the priority list. So much better we found if the project team that's trying to do the analysis are able to dive into the available data or, or content analysis, if it's more of a content project, as early as possible. And rather than just the technical people going off and doing their technical stuff or the data scientists disappearing off into their bubble to do their analysis, the hopefully cross-functional team sits down together and analyzes the data together in order to find out what the data tells us about the best opportunities and then let that guide the priorities rather than setting the priorities first and then finding that we don't have the data or the capabilities to deliver against those objectives. That sounds all pretty obvious, but as I say, I've found that as probably the number one issue undermining these projects at the, at the earliest stage. And of course, as we all know, once these projects go wrong, once any project goes wrong at the earliest stage, uh, it very quickly goes uh, off piste and it's very hard to get it back. And of course, with all the resulting loss of confidence uh, uh, that is required to uh, shepherd uh, any new project through any typical corporation. Second big success factor is, is learning and training and sharing that learning. So with any new staff, and as I say, unless you're a Google or a Facebook or a, or a digital first company uh, that's fairly sophisticated, most of this stuff is, is still new to most of our staff. And therefore, we need to help the, our staff, our employees, our colleagues train themselves and retrain themselves from the top of the business to the bottom. So the senior people need to understand what these techniques can and cannot do. And there's way too much over-promise around these AI techniques at the moment. But the maths is well understood and has been for decades. So there is really no excuse for over-promising. We know what the math can and can't do. We know what the compute power al uh, allows. So anyone that is over-promising, frankly, doesn't understand what this uh, today's AI stands for. The users of the tools need to understand how to combine the data, the technology, in order to uh, make the, do the analysis and come out with robust conclusions. Uh, and then the rest of the staff, our other colleagues, our other 
teammates on other projects need to understand what we're doing so that they can support us, we're relevant, uh, not get in the way, ideally, but so there's an understanding. It's not some top secret project that uh, builds uh, kind of resentment or, or confusion. So our firm belief, based on years of experience in these projects, both succeeding and failing, to be honest, is that we need to embed this type of AI learning and almost playing ethos in the business, i.e. we're learning and we're tra training, but we've got a set of tools that almost anyone can access and play with easily without specialist skills so they can start to build confidence around this area and really demystify it in many ways. Because um, as we said before, what we're trying to do um, you know, falls into a few straightforward camps. We're trying to analyze, we're trying to predict, and maybe we're trying to create content in some cases. Uh, we've, because we're in the industry, we've looked across a lot of the, the, the big uh, training courses in this space, and we've done many of them ourselves, and uh, many of them are, are absolutely fantastic. We have found overall that a lot of them are quite specialist, and they tend to be more for experts, data science experts, technical experts. But thankfully now, there is a new uh, group of, of trainers that are offering AI training for the rest of the population, and we definitely think that's a good thing. Success factor three, uh, data and content. Okay, so any of you that have been involved in these types of projects or tried to um, add them to a, a BI project will have found that this is where most of these projects shudder to a grinding halt. And this is because at best the data and the content that we need is scattered around multiple formats, across multiple formats, systems, and silos. And that's the best case in pretty much every business I've ever worked in. Uh, worst case, you don't even know what you need. Okay, so, and this is, this is you know, this is not just for these projects. This is, we probably recognize this for any project we've tried to do in, in corporate land. Let's start straight with the good news, because I think that's a familiar challenge for most of us. There are shortcuts, so that's the good news. So first of all, in this space, um, there is a big uh, belief in, in what we call open source, so sharing our work and helping other people with our learning, what we've done, what we've learned, the models we've built, where we've made mistakes, where we've succeeded. And what that means is no matter what you're trying to do beyond your basic business intelligence analysis, um, you can often find a model that someone else has built and made available for, for public use uh, in a number of um, online open communities. Um, and so as a result, we can often take these pre-made models and then adapt them using our own data. And as a result, you don't need to build a model from scratch. You just need to add in some of your data in order to tweak uh, some of the so-called layers in the model. And we'll talk more about that. Um, if you can't find a model that is helpful in analyzing the data in the way you want, um, the other good news is that some of the newest tools in this space allow you to build your own model uh, quite quickly and without needing extensive technical expertise. So what we mean here is if you go back uh, you know, five, six, seven, eight years, um, to do a lot of the stuff we take for granted today and we're talking about today, you'd need to be a, you know, a, a technical expert. You need to be able to code up some of these um, tools yourself or at least um, hold them together with code from, uh, from uh, code libraries, for example. But the new tools are trying to put the technical aspects in the background so that more people, including non-technical people, can take advantage. Um, so that's good news, and we'll talk about some of the most famous tools in that space. Um, thirdly, um, if you lack access to and this is, again, a common, common problem, either because you lack authority, you're in the wrong department, the boss of the right department doesn't like you, they're playing politics, all the usual stuff that we all see every day at work, not necessarily in where I'm working today, but have seen over the years. Yes. What we, the good news is that we can often find the data online, either in data libraries, and we'll mention some of these, or we can scrape data from the internet. 
and if we do scrape data from the internet, obviously permission based, we can then use low cost online teams such as Amazon's Mechanical Turks to tidy up the data for fast use. So if you are struggling to get the right data internally, don't forget that there's a whole world of internet data out there and often adapting that is strangely quicker than trying to get it out of, uh, I don't know, the CFO internally. CFOs there. Okay, um, and then next point here, with the latest tools that have merged just in the last few years in this space, uh, the data that we can use is really mixed. Uh, they can cope with quite a mixture of, of data types, whether it be numbers, logically, like finance numbers, a text such as English language text or other language text for translation or contract analysis if we're a lawyer, uh, images, um, either to identify certain types of images or create new images from old images, and even now uh, audio and, and video files. Um, so these tools, and uh, particularly uh, some of the deep learning tools, they can cope with less organized, less structured, slightly more messy data. Um, it's not to say that they're plug and play, they always need uh, some fiddling, but they are quite flexible in, in that respect. So let, let's look at some specific examples. So if our analysis, our business analysis that we're trying to do is to find the best people to target, so it could be the most profitable customers to look for, the best new recruits to bring into the business through HR, uh, you know, to find the best segments, the best clusters of people to reach out to first. Uh, because it's important for the business. Well, here we can use historic or and the latest uh, customer or indeed employee data to be on who we're trying to target and put that through these tools in order to cluster the data into segments and see which of those segments are the most attractive to go after first in, in a positive way. Um, if the question of the business analysis we're trying to do is very different and we're been asked by, um, could be the marketing team or could be the sales director or anyone else, how can we become more visible for our brand strengths no matter what industry we're in? Well, here we might pull in some data from the marketing side and the marketing systems and then again put it through these tools uh, which are relatively easy to use these days in order to measure and correlate and connect the marketing activities to the results measured within those systems. And what these tools do is they find the very best mathematically relationship between activity and, and results. And if the question is how can we improve our business communication in general, then that might be about pulling in data from our customer services team and analyzing that data, again, correlating the content that was used, what was said, if it's telephone conversations, with the satisfaction scores that came out of that process. And again, the key point is that with some of these AI tools, that data doesn't have to be quite so clean and structured uh, as has been in the past. Uh, these tools uh, can find out what are the relationships between these uh, these elements uh, on their own some of the time, depending on how we set it up. Okay, we mentioned that, uh, yeah, we covered off that point, the data coming from lots of different silos. Quite often, these systems are very flexible. Um, okay, now, with these latest tools, and we will name some specifics in a second, um, this data can usually be uploaded into these latest AI tools, uh, either manually through a CSV file, for example, or from machine to machine through some kind of a, a data gateway or as they call it, an API. Um, and then the AI tool is able to put in the data in the form that we've chosen, whether it's numbers, images, text, and then translate it effectively or compile it into a format that the analysis part of the AI system can understand. Um, and if you ever studied uh, something called uh, matrices uh, back in college or school days, it tends to be a, 
uh, sort of uh, 16 to 18 year old math subjects these days, I understand, then uh, there is uh, some um, analogy between a matrix and the sort of data types that some of these AI systems use. Uh, and then the system chunders through the data, cycles through the data repeatedly, and finds the closest relationship between the two things we're trying to correlate, the activities and, and the results. The other good thing about these tools and, and where they can uh, enhance existing business intelligence tools, uh, for example, is that um, they we can tell them what sort of level of accuracy we're looking for. Are we trying to beat basic guesswork? Might be 50-50. Are we, uh, do we need 99% accuracy because it's a really mission critical question we're trying to answer or in healthcare we can't afford any mistakes. Uh, and the system will chunter on uh, and in order to get to that level of accuracy. Now it's not guaranteed it will get there, but it will, it will let you know where it's got to and how close it's got. So it's sort of scoring itself along the way. Just seeing how questions come up, let me just dive in and quickly answer that, which is the modus operandi recommended on here. So questions come in is, uh, rumor has it some of Amazon's AI for recruiting is trained solely on keywords from the CVs of certain demographic. How well does the proprietary model have to be trained to achieve a consistently fair outcome when it is implemented into a program? I've been told that some ATS platforms have diversity top-ups which level off bias outcomes that AI algorithms tend to, to give. Could this be an operational risk to a fast cost-based startup? What solutions are there? Okay, so very good question from Alfred there regarding uh, bias in the system, particularly around uh, recruitment uh, software and how that can be tackled. So again, huge topic, uh, we could spend a whole session on that. Let me just give you a couple of pointers on that. So end of the day, it's not the software and the machine that creates the bias. Uh, the software and the machine just finds the tightest mathematical relationship between the data that's fed in. So the bias has come from the data. And so in this example, for example, if you, if you feed in a load of CVs that uh, relate to technical people, uh, then obviously the system is going to analyze um, the data based around the profiles of technical people rather than artists or musicians. It's an extreme example, but I think it really clarifies, you know, what, what is the core issue here. Now, around demographic issues, I think some of the cases that have come to light have been that because the best work in this space has tend to come from the big, uh, you know, te techno giants, um, uh, you know, the Googles, the Facebooks, uh, not to say any of those uh, have made these specific mistakes. And because those companies tend to hire a certain demographic uh, for a variety of reasons, then until they became aware of this bias risk, some of the results uh, were that, 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 uh, that were published were, were sometimes shown to have a bias. Um, and one of the, the solutions that has been put forward and is working to an extent is to make sure that data goes in, uh, has a mixture of uh, you know, demographics represented. Now that can easily be done from the data itself. So if you've got a mixture of demographics represented in your data set, or what some companies are now starting to do is create uh, dummy data uh, based on, you know, if we're looking at analyzing CVs or people's working profiles, obviously some of that data can be accessed uh, you know, with permission, of course, from companies like LinkedIn. And therefore, if internally your CV set is very biased to one demographic, you might buy in further data from one of these sources to make sure the other demographics you wanted to cover were fairly represented. So, Cut kind of long story short, uh, it's not the software that's creating the bias, it's the data. Obviously, the data is biased. It's going to, the results can reflect that bias. The solution at the moment is to make sure the data is balanced. If you can't do that with real data, many companies are now uh, using dummy data, either artificially created or, or bought in to, to balance things out. So hopefully, Alfred, that goes some way to help uh, answer that question. Uh, feel free to ping uh, further questions or, or follow up afterwards, and we can we can chat further. Okay, so going back to where we got to, um, the fourth success factor, choosing these tools. Um, 
So, let's come on forward to the next next page. Um, so, the great seven years. Uh, if you go back, you know, five, six, seven years, the first generation of tools in this space, you know, from the likes of Google and Amazon, and Microsoft. Uh, and, and others required both often required both technical skills and data experts to to get working. Mm -hmm. uh, the second generation that came out over the last sort of five years, uh, the the, te the the technical requirements were kind of hidden behind, um, but you did still need to be a data science expert to use them. Uh, and those were you know great tools that are still available from the likes of Google and Microsoft and Amazon. Now the new generation of tools have started to hide not both the technical difficulties but also some of the data science complexity. These are often called driverless AI or auto machine learning tools so that anyone can, can actually uh, use them. Now, um, we always recommend using, at particular start of these projects, the simplest, low-cost tools so that all of the project teams can get involved, not just the specialists and experts. Um, the good news is that you know, Google have got their cloud. I think it's called Auto Machine Learning now. It's changed names a few times. Amazon have got their SageMaker tool. Microsoft have got their automated ML tool. All of those tools have free trials, so you can try them out, uh, I believe, I'm pretty sure. Last time I checked, free of charge, and so they're a great place to start. Uh, I would argue you still do need some confidence and knowledge around data science to, to, to really be comfortable using them, but they're definitely an uh, amazing uh, offering, especially considering you can try them out uh, initially, uh, mostly free of charge. And then there's a whole new raft of startups, less famous names, that are also offering similar uh, tools in this space. We've got one, I won't make this a sales uh, session at all. Have a look at today's simpleai.com if you're interested in these things and you'll see what we've set up in this space and I'll say no more about that. Okay, finishing off this section, we'll look at some case studies. Um, so how do we use these tools? So. Generally, these projects break down into to, to several stages. There's a first a sort of prototyping stage where we're playing with data, trying to look for positive, useful business correlations. Um, and then if, if, if that works, we then say, okay, we take that to our senior managers and say, look, this is really showing value. Let me, you know, here's proof of concept or here's proof. Let me give me some more resources or budget so I can really scale this up. And then we also break this these these projects down into uh, a training stage and this is where we use the historical data to train the prediction model or the model that we're trying to create um, and then a, a testing and, and, and prediction stage where we first test the model to see if it's achieving the accuracy that we needed if it's still 50% accuracy then we might as well return to our guesswork um, obviously, as it gets up towards 90% uh, accuracy, it starts to be really attractive to the business. And then rollout is when we start using that uh, tool, proven tool, on new data to make fresh predictions that are useful for us in the future, whether it's around sales, finance, etc. Okay, the other good thing about some of the new platforms that I've mentioned already is that whereas in the past, uh, and, and it's still very common, many people would be prototyping on one system and then building the final enterprise product for, for mass use on a, on, on a different system, often a totally different system. And obviously that has some, well, that has some advantages. Different experts can use the tools they, they enjoy most, but it also has disadvantages because you build a successful prototype and then you basically got to almost start from scratch again to build something that actually works in the real world, so to speak. Good thing about some of the new platforms we talked about, they can do the prototyping and they also can cope with scaling up to enterprise level requirements and that makes things uh, simpler and reduces delays, uh, we found. What do we do with the outputs from these models? Well, you know, if we're sophisticated, we may be feeding these predictions into, you know, either our existing business intelligence 
systems, most of the business intelligence systems I've used over the years, brilliant for visualization, good for linear predictions, but currently don't tend to be used as often as they should be for more complex predictions, nonlinear predictions. These AI tools are mathematically proven to be often very strong at more complex nonlinear predictions, and therefore they can feed that prediction data into uh, the business analysis, the BI, the business visualization tools, so that you've got new predictions that are sometimes um, better in different ways to the ones that we're already using or certainly should be compared side by side. Now that could be done in a sophisticated system through a data gateway such as this so-called uh, API. Uh, but also I find for many companies what's most useful, if they're not a really digital first company, very tech data savvy company, they just need a, a new machine to do these analyses so they can look at the results and compare it to their other uh, data analysis programs they're already using and just check they haven't missed anything. Okay, um, so yeah, last few points then. So overall my conclusion, been in this space uh, for quite a number of years now, is that for most companies I talk to, the non, you know, the non-Googles, non-Facebooks, we're very much in a play and learn stage, but in terms of serious play, not, not mucking about, of course. Um, and so the best thing we find with these projects to avoid uh, instant, um, you know, getting stuck in the mud and, and getting derailed and going off piste is to quickly agree with project stakeholders the areas that might be worth exploring, quickly gathering the data that is available, uh, whether it's from internal sources or uh, accessed in externally or scraped from the web with permission if that's relevant, starting with that rather than waiting for the perfect data set, and then using these new AI tools just to start with so that all the team can be involved, not just the experts, uh, don't require specialist knowledge so we can get going fast, and then in, encourage this culture of playing and learning and celebrating success, playing in a, in a serious sense, so that anyone can go to the tools, try things out, test different hypotheses, and then get on with their busy days. And that's definitely an approach um, that I found uh, helps us avoid some of the um, things that cause essentially a large failure rate in a lot of these projects. Okay, just going to move back to the case study section plus here, and then uh, that will leave us a little bit of time for any questions at the end and uh, wrap up without taking up too much of your time today. Okay, so we'll start here. Let me just check anything else coming up on the main screen. No, it looks all fine and quiet at the moment, so that's good, I think. Okay, so case studies. So let's talk about some big companies at the moment. So Adobe, many of you will have heard of Adobe, and many of you will be using some of their system, whether it's their digital design systems or their advertising tools and marketing tools. Now, they have been adding this thing called machine learning, which is a type of artificial intelligence. And as I mentioned at the beginning, it's well understood, well established, been used for decades, for example for example, in terms of uh, stopping spam emails. Um, now, they've been putting it into their tool set in order to give access to thousands, if not tens of thousands of brands, allowing those brands, their clients, to create real-time personalization decisions so that if you're sending out an email using your, Amazon, uh, your Adobe tools, you can tailor the content of the email, even down to the individual, if you've got the right data, send this one the right type of shoe they like, send this one the right type of baked beans they like in real time. I've seen that happen, not on the Adobe system, and it is uh, extremely impressive. Um, on the recruitment side, and, and we heard from Alfred, there was some interest there. Um, so companies like PricewaterhouseCoopers, L'Oreal, Unilever, have talked in the public domain about case studies where as always, they want to work out, you know, what makes good, you know, what makes the top employees tick. Not that all employees are not valuable, but how do we find more of the real top performers? Because uh, every company wants those. And so what they did was they looked at some of their top performers within their businesses, and they used uh, some of these AI analysis tools um, to first ask questions of those employees to find out what sort of profile they had, turn that profile into a model. 
uh, as we've been talking about. And then uh, that allowed the HR department, the recruiting people, to go out and look for similar models, similar people when they were doing their recruiting uh, practices. And I think anyone that's been involved in recruitment I have for years know that, uh, yes, we, we try and do a really good job and we're, we're getting better all the time, but there's still a lot of uh, luck in a successful recruitment process, and this tries to bring some science to the table. Uh, now, the big name, Microsoft, they own LinkedIn now. They want these types of AI, today's AI, to be available to millions of their customers at a click of a button. So they're building into everything. You get it in your email when it suggests how to, you know, what words to put into your email reply. You've got it in Excel. You've got it in uh, LinkedIn around recommendations, who to connect with. And what Microsoft has recognized, and I've used uh, some of their tools since they, uh, well, since their Azure tool first launched um, machine learning, I think it was about five years ago, to the, in, in the public domain. And they really recognize it needs, if it's not made as simple as possible, then the majority won't use. Uh, so if they've seen that from all their data, then it's something that we all definitely need to uh, adopt as well. Um, on the more creative side, many of you read uh, newspaper articles about these artistic robots, uh, such as this one, Ida, recently in the press because uh, it uh, has created uh, and sold more than a million uh, pounds, I think, years worth of art based on what it sees around it. So it looks around, it takes inspiration from its surrounding visual, and then it paints pictures, and, and those pictures are sold uh, more than a, a million. So in terms of data here, you know, I think what's important is that the data we can feed into these systems to help with our existing systems comes from everyday surroundings. It doesn't need to be always a perfectly clean data set, depending on the, the technology we're using. Another creative one on the copywriting side, so writing copy for advertising or email headlines. Now, the technology still is best at short text. So uh, in this case, the example is Alin Mama, which is a Chinese company, part of the Alibaba family. And they're using uh, these uh, tools to write headlines and advertising slogans for their digital ad. And uh, they claim and I think it's been checked, that they, they, some of their tools can pump out as many as 20,000 lines of well-written Chinese uh, per, per second, which is just incredible. And outside of China, we also start to make progress in that area. Starbucks, of course, very active in this space. Uh, they've got a huge amount of data from millions of users, and they're now combining that and using these tools so that the knowledge in that database is made available to their baristas so that eventually when you go into the more sophisticated stores, the baristas will know what you like for the time of the day, what snacks you might like suggested, um, based on the data that you've permitted them to use or cluster data for similar people to you. Now, the example here is too often this data is, is held in the marketing department or the data department and as a result, doesn't get out to the front line quickly enough. Uh, and this is an example of how, using these tools, we can actually get it out to the front line as quickly as possible. Okay, um, Tesla, the uh, electric car company, uh, as you many of you will know, it has uh, it is gathering data at an incredible pace from its hundreds of thousands of cars that are currently on the roads, and as a result, creating these amazing models, uh, maps of, uh, of, of of the roadways that its passengers are, are driving down. Um, and again, it shows how these cars and the, these AI systems can deal with you know, quite messy everyday data and make it sense of it and make it useful commercially. And, and on the back of this success, Tesla has become a top-selling brand in some of the most competitive uh, car markets in, in the world. Just kind of skimming through here and just trying to cover off a variety of examples just to give a, a mixture of flavors. Uh, here's an image-based one. So Coca-Cola in Asia has been using uh, images uh, from uh, retailers 
uh, in order to identify where products is going out of stock. So we talked about some of these tools being able to analyze images and recognize things in images, not just dogs and cats, but Coca-Cola cans in this case. And as a result, send the data through to frontline staff and ultimately through to stores to tell them where the product's out of stock and they need restocking. And as a result, in this case study, they're quoting uh, an improvement of 1.3% uh, you know, uh, uh, market share, which obviously for a company that big is, is, is quite uh, incredible and very attractive. Uh, no surprise at all that Amazon is using this technology for its recommendations. Uh, currently, in this case study, it was quoted that 30% uh, of sales uh, of certain uh, departments are now coming through its recommendations. And uh, this is because these recommendations and these AI systems can cope with huge amounts of data and make recommendations that are relevant down to a, a single customer. So it's recommendations down to a segment of one, which the traditional BI tools sometimes could struggle with or just. Okay, uh, let me just quickly check, see if any other questions have come up on the screen. Let's get into the last few minutes of this. Uh, looks all fine for now. Okay, um, again, on the uh, content creative side, not quite sure what the mix of the audience is today, but many of us, uh, many of the people in, in the media and in the marketing side are wondering, uh, you know, are jobs at threat because robots are going to start writing our copy and our text and maybe reading it as well. Uh, as I said before, there's still, these, these tools are struggling beyond uh, you know, single sentence headlines uh, based on a lot of historical text analyzed. Um, but uh, in, in, in this case, a recent test run by a major news organization uh, where the AI tool was asked to come up with headlines and it competed against some top notch journalists come up with those headlines. And uh, some of the results, uh, such as the example you can see here, were judged by the journalists, the cynical hacks, to be just as good as what they were coming up with. So certainly in terms of small text amounts, they are uh, getting, um, you know, really performing strongly. Um, this is another example you might have seen recently where one of these tools is taking up data from lots of photos that it's been fed, hopefully with permission, and then creating a brand new face, a non-existent face, from all of that data, so creating new content from old. So as I say, this is actually on a website called thispersondoesnotexist.com, and this, this, this image is not of a real person. It's a, it's a recreation of a face based on uh, other uh, people's photos. Last example or so, uh, this is one from our own experience of so working with uh, some large sports and retail brands uh, a few years ago now. They were looking for new opportunities, new trends, new insights from their historical customer data with millions of customers. And uh, what we found um, was that with one type of, of this type of using this type of so-called AI tool, we're able to challenge some of the long-held assumptions that we had within the business. And then we challenge those assumptions about how we were marketing and what we were marketing to who, um, able to personalize that marketing much more accurately down to the almost the individual, uh, those adjustments we measured very carefully and used control groups to really make sure that we are scientifically testing the technique, they were actually delivering consistently double digit growth. Uh, and that was one of the first times when I personally saw these tools, this is quite a few years ago now, really proving their worth uh, beyond uh, any any doubt, statistically proven. So just concluding there, based on these case studies, uh, we can conclude that you know use of AI is currently stretching from proven, long-established practice, commercially proven, to, to totally experimental. And it never makes sense that all of us as companies adopt a similar approach, invest in the business critical proven stuff, and test and trial, and even play in a, in a, in a, in a serious way in the more experimental areas. Um, so just to summarize, and then we'll see if there's any final questions. So why do we need these new tools to enhance what we're already doing in the business analysis and business intelligence way? Well, the point is that we've got some great tools already, but these 
enhance them and often do the analysis in a way that we're not currently using. It's not to say the tools couldn't be used in that way, they're just not currently set up in most of the companies I've worked with. And so by using some of these newer tools, these low-cost tools, we can get access to this AI analysis power without huge cost. Uh, and we can play and learn and test and train our staff to get ready for these, uh, these, new, these new opportunities. Um, okay, we covered off a lot there. I hope it's uh, it's hung together and made some sense along the way. Uh, if you haven't done these projects end to end, there's probably bits of it that were less clear than others. What I would say is that I'll be making available a summary of the document. I can't release it all due to uh, some uh, restrictions on that, but I'll make available a, uh, a summary version um, that will have most of the headlines in there. Always welcome to get in touch with me directly. I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, a lot of this material comes out of a book that I'm currently publishing, so uh, feel free if you want to get a copy of that, get in, get in touch. Um, and yeah, always welcome questions, always believe in kind of good karma in this space, helping us all get better at this so we can all benefit together and hopefully help the billions of people that have never had access to these capabilities uh, traditionally. Okay, I'm going to flip back now to the main screen to see if there's any final questions that have come up. And uh, if not, uh, we'll, we'll, we can wrap up there as we're just in the, the final stage. Um, okay, I think, I think we've covered it all off. Let me just check all these sections. Oh, and one more has come in. Let me just check that out. Okay, okay, so just a question there. Uh, thank you for the very informative presentation. Thank you, glad it was. It will also be available for download after the presentation. So what I'll do is, um, there are some slides currently on the website, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll make a better selection of what I've shown today. I can't give everything away, mainly because it's going into the book and, and going on Amazon and, and they have restrictions as to what I can give away for that. But if, if you want, uh, you know, the full book, summary I'll provide doesn't, give the bit you, you need, just get in touch through through LinkedIn, through Bright Talk, and I'm sure I can help out. Okay, I think that's all the questions we've got, so um, I'll leave this running, but I'll stop talking now. Thank you all for your time. Uh, welcome your, your feedback, and yes, do, do, do keep in touch, and let's uh, help, let's help each other in this space, uh, and uh, let's do it all in a, in a, in a good, ethical way. Thanks again, and hope to uh, hear, to hear from you, some of you in the future. Cheers now.